This week we're going to be dealing with the Wittig reaction in experiment 15. Uh, the Wittig reaction is one of those named reactions that actually finds a lot of use uh, to organic chemists. It allows us to form carbon-carbon double bonds uh, from either ketones or aldehydes. And in this lab we're going to be dealing with aldehydes. So it allows us to uh, transform a carbon-oxygen double bond into a carbon-carbon double bond. So it's a very important reaction. Again, it's one of these few reactions that allow us to form carbon-carbon bonds, and in this case, it allows us to form alkenes very well. Uh, it is a very high-yielding reaction. The yields on these reactions are typically quantitative, so 100%, uh, but it can range anywhere from 80 to, to 100%, uh, but quantitative is not unheard of. It's a very chemoselective reaction. I'll talk about that in a moment. In other words, it doesn't uh, interfere with a number of functional groups, so it's quite tolerant in that regard. It's regioselective, that is we know exactly where that carbon, carbon double bond is going to end up in the product. We don't have to worry about a mixture of uh, alkenes. Uh, so for example, I've drawn an example here where we've got uh, an aldehyde attached to a benzene ring that also has another functional group on it, and I've just arbitrarily selected the nitro group. Um, that will react with what's known as an ilin. What I've got here is drawn in the ilene form, but this is also known as an ilin. We'll talk about that in just a moment. And when these react with one another, wherever that carbon-oxygen double bond is, is where the new carbon-carbon double bond is going to appear in the product. So it's very regioselective. It doesn't end up anywhere else. And the ilin or the ilene does not interact at all or uh, uh, react at all with the uh, nitro group. Notice we also get another uh, product here, triphenylphosphine oxide, which is a byproduct. Uh, the phosphorus oxygen double bond is one of the strongest bonds in organic chemistry, uh, and so this allows it uh, to go essentially to completion. This is one of the reasons why this reaction is so high yielding. This is a very stable molecule, and so as the reaction proceeds, the equilibrium is shifted extremely far uh, to the right. However, this reaction does typically suffer poor stereoselectivity. So in this example, we've got a methyl group and a hydrogen on this carbon that comes from the uh, ilin. And notice I've used squiggly lines to denote those. The uh, methyl group could either be near the uh, benzene ring or it could be on the other side and, and vice versa for the hydrogen. And so usually one ends up with a mixture of both the cis and trans alkenes in this particular reaction. So that is one of the downsides of the Wittig reaction, but if that's not of concern, then it, it's a very powerful reaction because it allows us to form these carbon-carbon bonds in both a chemoselective and regioselective uh, fashion. So let's talk a little bit about the ilins and how they're made. Uh, ilins are typically made uh, quite easily from alkyl halides. Uh, the ilin that we'll be using this weight comes from uh, benzyl bromide. Uh, we're not going to actually make the, Ill, uh, the uh, first salt that we uh, are going to see. We're not going to start with the uh, uh, benzyl bromide as our starting material here because it turns out that benzyl bromide is a lacrimator. It makes people cry very easily. Uh, it's kind of like a, a tear gas in a lot of ways, and so uh, it's not the most friendly reagent to have around. But if you were to take that and react that with triphenylphosphine, so a phosphorus atom with three benzene rings attached to it, the phosphorus atom has a lone pair on it, which makes it a good nucleophile. The benzyl bromide, bromine's a good leaving group, so it's a good electrophile. And so we can expect an SN2 reaction where the phosphorus kicks out the bromide leaving group, and this is typically done in a solvent like diethyl ether, and we form as our first product what's known as a Wittig salt, as we call them. So there's a formal positive charge on the phosphorus. Of course, we have to have a counterbalance. That's the bromide. And we form this salt. These typically precipitate right out of solution and are easily filtered. Uh, fortunately for us, these are also fairly inexpensive and easily purchased. So that's what we're going to be starting with this week in lab. And so we also should note that we have two hydrogens on the carbon that's attached to the phosphorus in this particular case. And to generate the ilin, we're going to be using lithium hydroxide as a base. 
And it turns out that these hydrogens right next to the phosphorus become fairly acidic uh, because that phosphorus has a formal positive charge on it. And so, we get a negative charge on that carbon. We still have a positive charge on the phosphorus. Plus we get water and lithium bromide, which precipitates out of solution. Okay, so the water will separate, the lithium bromide will, will fall out of solution. This is technically known as an illid, when you have adjacent charges that are opposite to one another, like this, this is known as an illid. But one can also draw this in what's known as the illine form, where we have no formal positive charge where we think of this having, as having a double bond between the uh, phosphorus and the carbon. This is the most convenient way to draw it, simply because you don't have to go back in and put in those uh, formal positive charges. However, this is probably the easiest way to view uh, this reagent and how it's going to react. Since we have a negative charge on this carbon, we would expect this carbon to function as a good nucleophile. And that's, in fact, what happens. So we're going to just focus on this resonance structure of the illid at this point, and once we've generated the illid in lab, this will become kind of a yellow color as the reaction proceeds. So once you've added the lithium hydroxide, you should see your, your solution turn yellow. If you don't see a, a yellow color, uh, get in touch with your TA because you've probably forgotten to add something uh, correctly. Uh, at this point, once we've generated the illid, we're going to add in uh, an aldehyde. In this case, we're using paratolualdehyde, and we know, of course, that the aldehyde is a good electrophile, so nucleophiles should attack that quite easily, break that weakened uh, pi bond of the carbon oxygen, so we will have that occur. Now we've just formed our new carbon-carbon bond between this carbon and this carbon, which used to be the aldehyde carbon. So we've got a new carbon-carbon bond here. And now all we have to do is get rid of the oxygen and the phosphorus, basically, and put a double bond between those two carbons. And we know that that's going to happen. And the way that we believe that happens is that you end up going from this so-called uh, betaine intermediate to the oxophosphatane so it's a four membered ring kind of closed up here and then what happens is these electrons fold in on themselves pushing like this you end up with a triphenyl phosphine oxide, which has that strong phosphorus oxygen double bond, which is the driving force, plus the alkene. And I'm going to draw that again with a squiggly line, indicating that there is poor stereoselectivity. You're going to end up with a mixture of cis and trans. And uh, if you run your TLC very carefully, you will see two spots for this particular. Uh, product if you don't get it too concentrated on the TLC. However, you will see product and you will see the triphenylphosphine oxide, which typically doesn't move very far on the TLC. It usually stays pretty close to the origin. Your product will actually move quite a ways up. And then you're going to also spot the aldehyde and the starting uh, Vitic salt in one of your lanes on the TLC so that you can identify uh, pretty conclusively which spot is your uh, product. Very important to um, read that journal article that's listed in your manual before coming to lab. We will take some uh, pre-lab questions uh, on your quiz from that journal that talks about generating uh, illids uh, using lithium hydroxide. So you can get that uh, journal article free of charge using the USM network. We have, uh, uh, we have access to those journals through the library, so you can go on there and get that uh, with no problem.